It's 530. I'd like to call the meeting order of the uh, Beaufort County Board of Commissioners. This be in our uh, July the 5th meeting. At this time, we're going to stand, and I'm going to ask Jerry Lang Langley to do the uh, invocation and Commissioner Buzzio to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. <coughs> Eternal God, our Father, we are grateful and thankful for this very moment in time. We are grateful, God, for the opportunities you have afforded us, and God, we are thankful that you have allowed us to come together one more time to do the business of your people. Lead us and guide us in our de decision making. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> At this time, if you have a cell phone, I'll ask that you put that either on vibrate or power it all the way off. Does any commissioner have a conflict of interest that needs to be disclosed tonight? I have none. Okay. Being none, we'll move into the agenda. Uh, any change in the agenda for tonight's meeting? If not, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Buzio. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Brand. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Vote was unanimous, Katie. We're down to the uh, public comment, and we have a total of 10 people tonight. Uh, you have a maximum of three minutes, so if I gavel you down, you'll have to take a seat. Uh, the first one I have here is uh, Ray Leary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. During the June 12, 2017 regular meeting of this board, approved a motion to refund money borrowed from the general fund to start some projects that you hope to fund from the sale of general obligation bonds at some future date. This $3 million proposed debt has not been approved by the voters. The Local Government Commission has published guidelines on debt issuance. Manager Alligood referenced these guidelines during the recent meeting of the Finance Committee where he apprised the committee that in order to meet the requirements of the LGC, the staff would not be ready to seek formal approval until August 2017. <clears throat> the Citizens for Better Government Committee has studied the requirements of the Local Government Commission and the general statutes for the issuance of debt by counties. We think those requirements raise significant issues relative to the way in which this board has made its decision to borrow $3 million. Consequently, if the board continues with this plan, we anticipate significant opposition. North Carolina General Statute 159-13C says, the budget ordinance of a local government shall levy taxes on property at rates that will produce the revenue necessary to balance appropriations and revenues. After taking into account the estimated percentage of the levy that will not be collected during the fiscal year, the budget ordinance of a public authority shall be balanced so that appropriations do not exceed revenues. <clears throat> End of quote. In fairness to you, I'll advise you that if this board proceeds as you are currently planning, the Citizens for Better Government will oppose this issuance of debt before the LGC, as well as potential legal action to ensure compliance with LGC guidelines and general statutes. We respectfully request this board publicly review the LGC requirements and correct the errors it has already made in this proposed debt financing. One of the possible corrections that should be considered is a budget amendment that reduces expenditures in lieu of borrowing any money without a vote of the people. This board is gambling with this budget. I say that because you are betting on the come. That's a technical term from a casino. In this case, you are betting the LGC will come through and approve this debt. And we are still a tier one county. Thank you. Uh, Bill Van Staldine. You need my name and all that? No. Address, okay. U.S. commissioners and the Utility Commission tell us to compromise. We presented a justifiable case as to how this proposal would hurt Teresia Christian School. It appears you want us to compromise with a company we don't trust so that you and the Utilities Commission can rubber stamp this project without making any tough decisions. We are in fact the victims who are being moved in on. 
Your June 12 resolution says to seek compromise where appropriate. It's puzzling to me since you say your hands are tied on this issue, but can then tell us to compromise. It seems that we, if, if we compromise, we forfeit further legal action. It is disturbing to me that your resolution seemed to be written prior to hearing David Butcher and Alan Meyer speak who were on the agenda. Please stand tall, be brave, show some true support to your constituents. If you allow Wilkinson Solar to build on the proposed location, what recourse do we have a school have if we lose enrollments and are forced to downsize or to close? Who will make it right for us? Wilkinson Solar, Invenergy, the landowner, or the Beaufort County Commissioners? Wilkinson Solar on June 22 submitted a new proposal to the Utilities Commission. If they're changing their proposal at the state level, doesn't this start things over at the county level? There's no evidence that permits are in place. So what's holding you back? Please stop this proposal now. From our initial contact with April Montgomery, our experience with her have created distrust. Her statements and in her affidavits tell of a timeline of contacting us and show how calculated her timing is. Her first attempt to reach out to us as a school was contacting the school during spring break while no one was at school leaving a <coughs> voice message. The seemingly calculated last minute contact compromised our ability to have representation at evidentiary hearing in Raleigh. After Utilities Commission urged both parties to have further communication, she made another seemingly calculated attempt by leaving another voicemail on Alan Meyer's home phone at 4 p.m. on a Friday. This message was not heard till Saturday and we had no way to concur with legal counsel until the following Monday. Our board members represent the school as volunteers. Being contacted late on a Friday to attend a meeting the following Wednesday at 1 p.m. was not possible. From these calculated moves and our time constraints, we have chosen to deal with them through legal counsel. Any good neighbor, as Invenergy continued to describe themselves, would have worked harder to make contact earlier and have not stopped calling until contact was made. A good neighbor would have set up a meeting in Beaufort County, not in Raleigh, and would have possibly, that would have possibly allowed board members to attend a closer venue. If this shows the integrity of the parties involved, are you willing to sign off on them building and decommissioning? Time. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin Beasley. Good evening. I attended Terracia Christian School kindergarten through the 12th grade, and I believe Terracia Christian School is an invaluable resource in our community that must be protected, and we are asking you, the Beaufort County Commissioners, to help protect it. I also attended the North Carolina Utilities Commission hearing on May 22nd and 23rd in Raleigh, North Carolina, and this is a quote from NC Utilities Commissioner Brown Bland, and I quote, Miss, Mr. Butcher and the Terracia citizens, they know their situation best. They live there every day, and they've contributed over the years. They've developed this area specifically, it sounds to me, for farming and for living and carving out a life. And they created this school that has served a good purpose. They put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it. And you can tell from the passion and pride, and they're diligently following this case, that they care about it. Commissioner Brown Bland also stated, the Terracia community, and in particular, that school that has been brought into that has been brought to our attention is part of not only the Terracia community's heri heritage, but the state of North Carolina's heritage. This quote, quote speaks to the importance of Terracia Christian School and the Terracia community. Commissioner Brown Brand quickly identified the importance that Terracia Christian School holds not only within the community, but Beaufort County and the state. Acting as the oldest K through 12 Christian school I urge you to also take interest in your citizens and protect Terracia Christian School by stopping the installation of Wilkinson Solar. I have personally visited every single office in the NC Legislature and they have all directed us back to you. The Beaufort County Commissioners. Utilities Commissioner Gray also advised us that you are the ones we must contact in order to achieve real results. Senator Cook and Senator Boswell, we spoke with them just yesterday at the 4th of July celebration, advised us to contact our commissioners daily in order to achieve results. They continue to say it's not too late for you to take action. So why is North Carolina saying it's not too, set, too late, but you say the ship has sailed? 
Why is this so? For if it is true, I surely hope this sailing ship sinks. In addition, um, the Carolina Journal has published an article on June 23rd, since the last meeting, revealing that landowner Gertrude Respa signed a contract with Invenergy without a notary present. However, the contract was notarized by Sarah A. Kearns. This is evident that this company has a lack of integrity, and we are asking how are we to deal with a company that operates in this order? Thank you. Amanda Barnes, I'm sorry. I missed you when I oh, skipped. Okay. My name is Amanda Barnes, and I had the privilege of attending Teresia Christian School from kindergarten through 12th grade. Growing up in the community and attending the school helped shape who I am and my values. Values such as leaving a place better than you found it, working hard and doing your best at all times, even when no one is looking, putting others before yourself, being honest and trustworthy, serving others rather than just living for yourself, and putting people before possessions. I will begin my 12th year as a special education teacher at John Cotton Taylor School in Washington this fall. I believe I put these values to work every day to make a positive impact in this community. And I'm just one of many graduates from Teresia who are doing the same thing. I'm discouraged because it's your job to protect and support this very community. And you don't recognize the invaluable role that Teresia plays in our community. You show no concern for the safety and well-being of the children attending there or the vitality of this educational institution. It's increasingly disheartening when others outside our community, including state legislators and the North Carolina Commis Utilities Commission, recognize their concern and have more compassion and support than you, who are our very own commissioners and neighbors. I wonder if some of you would care more if this project was going up next to Bath Elementary School, where I know some of your grandchildren attend. I ask you to have the same regard for other children in Beaufort County as you have for your own. In speaking with you this evening, I hope to make you aware of the positive impact Teresia Christian School has on this community and as you as individuals. Think of the ways graduating students with these wholesome values impact our, our county. When I was voting this fall, I was addressed by one of your wives on my way to the Board of Elections. I stopped and talked with her, and she asked why I, to vote for her, why I should vote for her husband. The first thing she said was, my husband and I have three grandchildren here, and he cares about this community. I really hope what she told me was true and that he cares about this community, not just his own grandchildren. I hope you all care about this community because if you care about your community, you won't let children be in harm's way. If you care, you'll protect our school and make decisions to help it thrive. If you care, you'll listen to our concerns and support the citizens of this county rather than supporting the agenda of an outside company that exhibits only values of dishonesty and greed. Will you stand up for an educational institution that has been promoting good in our community for over 80 years or a company that seeks to destroy it? I'm gonna just briefly, if I have time, add a few points that um, Senator Bill Cook wrote in his letter to the North Carolina Utilities Commission. He quotes that the Teresia Christian School has an invaluable part, uh, is an invaluable part of this community with a rich history. Subjecting the students and staff of this school to potential harm is unacceptable. Moreover, subjecting the school to the possibility of loss of students and harming its vitality viability is inexcusable. He also goes on to talk to the potential damage of toxic materials and dangers to the children at the school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Jeannie Van Staldine. Jean. Jean, I'm sorry. I am here again asking you to help protect our children, heritage, and community. The Wilkinson Solar Project will be detrimental to all three. Not only will it have immediate negative impact on the county, it will also have a long-term consequences. Last week, an article published in the National Review stated, and I quote, a new study by Environmental Progress warns that toxic waste from used solar panels now poses a global environmental threat. The Berkeley Base Group found that solar panels create 300 times more toxic waste per unit of energy than nuclear power plants. <coughs> Discarded solar panels, which contain dangerous elements such as lead, chromium, and cadmium, are piling up around the world, <coughs> and there's been little done to mitigate their potential danger to the environment. 
While consumers might view solar panels as harmless little windows made from glass and plastic, the reality is, is that they are intricately constructed from a variety of materials, making it difficult to disassemble and recycle them. Solutions are hard to find, due both to labor-intensive process of breaking down the panels and to the low price of scrap." End quote. By allowing the Wilkinson project to proceed, you are letting Beaufort County become a toxic waste dump. Please don't let that happen on your watch. On May 17th, there was a public hearing held in Beaufort County with the North Carolina Utilities Commission. I was able to speak personally to all three commissioners that were present at the public hearing. All were sympathetic to our cause, and Commissioner Gray gave me some specific advice. He told me, you have to get your county commissioners to help you. I pressed him on this and asked if it was actually possible for you to help stop this project and he said, absolutely. They are the main people who can help you. I went on to ask him if he was sure that it wasn't too late for you to actually do something. And he said, no. He said, people change their minds all the time. And you could base your refusal to get permits to Invenergy on new information that had been given to you, et cetera. The permit hasn't been given yet. Will you please work together in following Commissioner Gray's advice and help us? At the very least, give us a nine-month moratorium. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deb Van Staldine. This is a letter written by my father-in-law, who I've always considered to be a pillar in the community, and um, he couldn't be here tonight. He just said his voice wasn't... Um, he just felt uncomfortable, so I'm going to read it for him. This is a letter concerning the proposal to build a 600-acre solar facility right next to the Terracea Christian School. Mm -hmm. Terracea is the heart of Beaufort County's great agricultural farm district. Terracea means heavenly land, and it is some of the best land in Beaufort County, producing yields of corn 150 to 200 or more bushel, bushels per acre, plus high yields of soybean, wheat, and <laughs> cotton. My dad and mother and 10 children left the Netherlands and moved to Canada in 1938, just before World War II broke out. Dad had always wanted to move to America, and in 1943, he was able to do so. Dad and mom and eight of us children moved to Terracea. The two older children stayed in Canada and moved later. One of the reasons Dad moved to Terracea was because of Terracea Christian School. Dad and Mom strongly believed in their parental duty as proclaimed in God's Word, Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This verse was also chosen as a motto for our school. They believed this promise of God, and so did my wife and I for our ten children who all went to Terracea Christian School. God has blessed us for it. Terracea Christian School was part of that blessing. I can remember those years I walked to school. I could see the farmers working, planting, cultivating, and harvesting their crops. It inspired me to become a farmer. Also, some of my children and grandchildren seeked an occupation in the farm agricultural industry. Now, what inspiration will the school children get by looking at acres and acres of solar panels for years to come? This solar facility is not only an eyesore, but is no asset to the community. We don't need it. It is a money-losing operation at the taxpayer's expense. To cover this land with solar panels seems sacrilege. If it wasn't for the subsidy, you would not see one solar facility. Who is going to clean up this mess after 25 years, and who is paying for that? I would like to know where the money trail goes. Who is benefiting from this solar operation? Why are, some lease, why are some leases paid more than others? What is all the hurry to getting this done without disclosing all the facts to the public? I love America, but I think it is time for some common sense. God said in Genesis 8, verse 22, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. All things are in his hand. I pray the wisdom may prevail. To God be the glory. Sincerely, William Van Staldinen. Thank you. Thank you. Bradley Van Staldine. I want to talk about the economic side of the solar facility. In the last meeting, y'all brought the fact that the solar facility would bring in an estimated $80,000 of tax revenue. And the so solar facility says that it will employ maybe one to three full-time employees. 
let's say on the bright side, they employ three full-time employees and they're making $50,000 a piece. That comes to $150,000 plus $80,000 in tax revenue comes to $230,000. That's all great, but we're forgetting about what's going to happen <clears throat> that's unlikely that TRC Christian School will be able to stay open if the solar facility comes in right next to it because enrollment will drop. TRC Christian School is paying over $600,000 a year to all of its employees, which is contributing to the local economy. Now that's just what the school is bringing to the local economy. Let's talk about taking 600 acres of cropland out of production for the solar facility. It is going to take away money from the agriculture sector. For example, an, ac an acre of corn costs a farm farmer over $500 an acre to raise. That money goes to the local ag retailers, local insurance agents, local equipment dealers, and local fuel providers. So if we do the math, that's another $300,000 taken out of the local economy. That brings the total to over $900,000 being taken out of the local economy. And this does not even include the income and property taxes that are being paid on the land by the landowner. I just don't see the argument that the solar facility is going to benefit Beaufort County economically when it will be losing over $900,000 just to gain $230,000. My two-year-old daughter can do that math and say that's not economic sense. I also want to ask why not grant a nine-month moratorium? What do y'all have to lose? And if anything, you can prove us wrong saying that there's nothing we could do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom Harris. Commissioners, <clears throat> I have a little different perspective. Um, there's a lot of advocates for Terracea Christian School here, but I come at it from a businessman's perspective. I started 10 corporations in six states, and and uh, come with a businessman's uh, perspective and it's hard to improve on what Bradley just shared I mean uh, that's uh, doesn't make economic sense but <clears throat> I look at solar farms as, as an adult fidget spinner it's a it's the latest fad everybody's doing it it's clean energy what could be wrong with that um, but it turns out a lot as some as uh, one of the other uh, I think Gene shared about the toxic waste 300 times as much a toxic, wa toxic waste per energy unit than, than nuclear. Um, I also look at, you know, the companies that are peddling solar farms, in my opinion, are hucksters, and they're out there waving money in front of citizens' hands and tempting them to take that money. That money is a windfall for those property owners, and it's a windfall for the solar farms because they make their money up front. Um, you know, they're getting government sub <laughs> subsidies, and so their, they ha their focus is on getting it done, getting the money up front, not what's going to happen and what that property is going to look like 30 or 50 years from now. Uh, people think they're being forward thinking and helping the planet in themselves. The reality is neither is true. Both parties are giddy about their short-term windfall um, without being forward thinking enough about the end game. The solar companies, um, you know, are, are, are not focused on what's going to happen 50 years from there. The landowner uh, has a handful of money, but it's kind of like a lottery winner. You know, after a few years, that money's gone, they're broke again. And now what have they got left? Their property is a toxic waste site. And, and what's going to happen to that? Who's going to pay for the cleanup? And also, <laughs> where is that going to go? California's head, uh, solar panel company generated 46 million tons of toxic sludge and contaminated water uh, that got distributed in nine states. Uh, what are we going to do with the toxic waste of these uh, panels when they've served their, their purpose? Um, the county commissioners, um, I think, one of the roles of the county commissioners is to represent their constituents. And it seems to me like to protect the unsuspecting property owner that's tempted to take that handful of cash and to protect the residents of this county uh, long term when they've got a toxic waste site um, as, as well as the disposing of that toxic waste. It seems the wise and prudent <coughs> thing to do to create a moratorium on any new solar farms 
which is what many of the counties are across eastern North Carolina are doing. So that's my recommendation. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, Paul Willard. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, I was here in 2013 fighting this same battle, but my wife and I were doing it by ourselves. We didn't have all these people that are here tonight. What I'd like to ask you tonight, commissioners, is think of you and this thing going in your backyard and around your property. What we need is an ordinance put in place in this county to prevent this from happening again, or it's going to continue to happen, and it could be in your backyard next time. And in providing with this ordinance, we need to do it before the permits, authorizations are granted to these solar farm companies or any other company on that fact that's trying to do something in this county. We need to put the people first and not second, third, and fourth. Quoting from a quote that was quoting from a little thing that was done through one of the campaigns by one of our commissioners now, I think it's time to stop the nonsense and let's get down to business. There's so much open, there's just so much land in this county that could be used for this, the o OLF property. I know it's good farmland, but it's out in the middle of nowhere. You could use some of that. You've got the VOA property out on the Voice of America Road. Totally useless, nobody even wants it. It's just sitting out there. We've also got the old Buffett County landfill, Hawkins Beach Road, useless. It's just sitting there. Dump a little bit once in a while, but not much. County could be getting that six to seven hundred dollars a month revenue per acre. There's still so many unanswered health questions that was asked in 2013. They were never answered because there's the answer you don't want to hear. It's hard to beat the last two speakers that spoke because they spoke pretty much what most of my what my Paperwork was on tonight. What we need to do is we've got to stop these, board, these big corporations from sneaking in under the radar and giving these Pearl Harbor attacks to the counties. And we're not the only county. There's some more being hit too. But until we put ordinances, zoning, whatever you want to call it, in place in this county, we can continue to have this. It's going to get worse and worse. When I was up, when I when I did mine with the Utilities Commission, there was oh, a bunch of people that were for the solar companies because they were, of course, they were benefiting from it in a lot of ways. Um, one just happened to be one of our leaders in the uh, Chamber of Commerce. She got up and spoke, and oh, she just told how many how many millions. Excuse me, Paul. Okay, uh, Amy Fire. I'm Amy Fire. I'm going to be. Excuse me. If you will. Thank you. I'm Amy Fire. Um, I have lived in Beaufort County for 12 years now. My husband and I chose this place because when it was time for us to start a family, it was the, such an amazing family community. It seemed so supportive. It seemed like it was growing. So today, I would like to see, I would like my girls to speak for me and. Um, let you guys hear from two young Beaufort County, Washington residents. This is my first. And if you don't mind, she's a little short. If it's okay, she can sit right here. It's fine. Hello, my name is Olivia Fett. I live in Smallwood in Washington. I've been a student at Montessori Preschool for the last several years. Before starting school, I was involved in the Beaufort County Youth Club. I was involved in the Beaufort County Youth Club. I was this school has been a huge change for my family and me. In the third grade, I was placed on lockdown because there was a terrible tragedy right beside my school. I was so close to the playground. He, we heard the gunshots. So I know firsthand that it is important to be very careful with your school surroundings. This way, this was when my mom and dad decided that they wanted to put Christ in as the center of my education and made my sister and I to cherish I'm so 
If anyone would like to leave, we'll we'll give you that opportunity, or you can stay uh, through the rest of the meeting. I let's see, we're down to items for discussion. I'm sorry. Consent. Items for consent. We we'll just. Okay, we're down to item number F, items for consent. <coughs> uh, is there any any item that you would like to pull out for a decision and further discussion? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I would need to make, to make a change in the room limits. Um, I'm currently the board of directors. Um, I, um, I changed one. I, I messed up one of the votes for the, um, the resolution opposing part of the Board of Education election. Um, Commissioner Richardson actually voted no. Commissioner Fuzzy voted yes. And I'll reflect this decision. Is that? Mm hmm Is yeah. that okay with both of you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion? motion? All right. Can I have a motion to approve the uh, items for consent? So moved. Motion by Commissioner Brennan. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Buzio. All those in favor of the uh, consent items, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Vote six to one. Okay, down to items for discussion. The uh, first one on here is Bayford County Address and Ordinance Update, uh, Commissioner Richardson. Well, at the last meeting, we uh, announced 
this needed to be an agenda item. We've, we've got some problems with uh, maintaining our addressing system. Now we have several departments that are involved in addressing, like EMS and the Sheriff's Department. Uh, we have also, in the past, uh, issued some street names to driveways. Uh, and the clerk has made, I think, available to all of you the addressing ordinance. Yes. Um, I've talked to Seth Laughlin, who handles this, and um, I think that we need to get a committee of uh, county stakeholders that are involved in this, like the Sheriff's Department and EMS and whoever else you want, and we all need to sit down and go through this addressing stuff and make sure that we have a, um, that, that everybody is on board with practices, plus we probably need to revise the ordinance to modernize it, because it was first passed in 1993. The, yeah, uh, just, uh, Adam, in uh, agreement with Mr. Uh, Commissioner Richardson, and be happy to put together a committee of folks to take a good look at this ordinance. It, well, like he said, it was um, adopted in 93 and probably has some room for modernization. I've spoken yes. with staff of the uh, Sheriff's Department, and they're certainly on board with this effort as well. Yeah, it's 24 years old. I, do you want to discuss a representation of the Sheriff's Department 911? EMS, oh, emergency, 911. Yeah, emergency services. Tax okay. tax department needs to be involved because they're involved with addressing. Um, fire department. Fire department, yeah. Anybody else you can think of. Okay. Seth, are you going to pull together those names for us? Yes, sir. With y'all's blessing, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. And if, you, if you've got a name you want considered, then uh, just shoot uh, Brian or Seth an email, is that okay? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to be on that committee when it's put together because I have a lot of knowledge about it. Okay. Will you, will you add him Absolutely. as a commissioner's representative? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Was that it? Yes, sir. I'll just in case there are any other questions. Okay. Do you have anything else? No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> All right. We're down to the uh, Finance Committee report. Uh, that's you, Anita. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Finance Committee did meet on June the 20th, 2017. The committee members that were present were Chairman Waters, Commissioner Brin, Brian Alligood, and myself. The first item was um, giving the committee an update on the sales tax audit um, that the North Carolina Department, Department of Revenue is conducting. If you'll remember back um, in March, um, I told you that I was notified by the state that we would be audited for a period of three years for our sales tax. Um, the state did request certain reports from us for that three-year period. On April the 6th, we did email those reports to the state. As of our committee meeting on June 20th, I had not heard back from the state, so there was a period of about what two and a half months that went by when I didn't hear anything so I was hoping they really forgot about it but of course we knew that wouldn't be the case so in fact a co just a couple of days later on June the 26th they did email us and say that they had gotten our reports and they actually made a selection of about a hundred invoices that they wanted to review so we're currently in the process of pulling those invoices and we should be able to send those to them um, by the end of next week. And then we'll see what happens after that. Well, can I ask a question? Sure. Yes. They're auditing because sales tax is broken into several different categories and they're auditing us to be sure that we spent the amount of money that we collected in sales tax under that particular item for the purpose yeah, I think they're checking for a couple of different things. First of all, I think they're checking to make sure that the proper county's getting credit for the sales tax. And second of all, I think they're, they're um, checking for the proper category, like whether it's food sales tax versus just regular retail sales tax. And there's designated uses for those things? Yes, yes. What happens if we're not spending all of the money I mean I, I'm not really sure I mean um, first of all I don't anticipate there'll be a lot of problems or a lot of findings now the fact of the matter is is that we pay about a thousand invoices a month so we do pay about 12 to 13 thousand invoices a year so we're talking about a huge volume of invoices and I mean it's entirely possible that somebody could make a mistake 
and and code out that um, a certain sales tax goes to one county when in fact it should have gone to another and and they may catch something like that but we'll just have to wait and see what they come but out. that would happen in Raleigh though we don't send we don't send sales tax money to other counties do we? they collect all the sales tax yes, money. yes but we file a report with them annually that and that report tells them from which county we purchase the goods that should get credit for the sales tax. Oh, really? Yes. Anita, if, if I understand it correctly, <laughs> it's on the items that the county purchases. That's yeah, right. I've got you. I've got you now. But when we said to other counties, I'm saying, well, are you know, are we we we're, we're doing business across county lines in some cases, in right? In some with cases, this. not often, but yeah, in some cases. So, would if we're if we're t collecting sales tax for a certain purpose, mm -hmm. and we're spending too much across the county line, what happens? Do we find a vendor in Beaufort County that can provide the same service? I mean, or do they just want the statistics? I think what they're doing is they're making sure that the funds are going to the right county that are that they're being allocated correctly. It's not that we're required to spend a certain amount in any place. There's some statutory requirements relating to sales tax, um, you know, the two percent and, and, and the Article right. 44 is where, where that money is supposed to be used for schools and other things. Earmarked. And, and, right. And we do that. I, I don't think that's the focus of it. I think the focus of it, of course, we'll find out when they when is they for into them it. to make sure that they are. It, and I think that's why they're doing it countywide, because they want to make sure that the sales taxes are going where they're supposed to be going. The, the distribution because there's a point of sale and some of it goes here and some of it goes there so they're making sure that it's all going to the right place and of course like Anita said we we document where we were where we buy things and then they say okay well if you purchase that from a vendor in Wake County a certain portion of that sales tax goes back to Wake County just like a certain portion would come to us if somebody in Wake County was buying something from Flanders or somewhere here so um, they're just making sure across the state that it's all getting to where it's supposed to go because it's pretty complicated. Piece. That does sound like it's yeah. a lot more complicated than I ever thought it was. <laughs> but it, then it's to our advantage to spend our money in Beaufort County when we can. Oh, sure. Uh, under this scenario. But we can't, I all understand we can't always do that. Equal, yes, unless we can get a really big discount. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, they're, they're also looking for purchases of like equipment there is some equipment that's tax exempt that's right and that's one of the things they're really <laughs> looking at they they do that with a lot of uh, equipment dealers that sell farm equipment I don't know what else is exempt outside the Ag committee but I know uh, as it relates to the agribusiness community there are some exemptions on equipment yes and there's certain equipment that we buy particularly um, in the water districts mm -hmm. that um, is sales tax exempt but then you pay a machinery tax on right. it instead and, and I think part of what this is you know you have a new state treasurer so I think it's him kind of putting his stamp and saying I've checked all these things because you know they also look at the state health plan and they're going through and confirming all the dependents on the state health plan so I think it's I think it's his office going in and saying we're gonna go back and double check everything and make sure we've got a good starting point and move forward from there so I think you'll see more things coming out of the state treasurer's office like that and I don't think they're just picking on Beaufort County yeah. they're doing many audits in our oh yeah area. okay um, next, Brian gave the committee an update on the 2008 GEO school bond refinancing. The refunding is on the July 11th Local Government Commission Executive Committee agenda, and Brian and I will be attending that meeting along with one of our representatives from um, Davenport Consultants. The next item was a discussion about a fraud hotline for county employees. Brian explained that there's a state hotline that anyone can call and file a complaint, but that the county could also choose to work with a third party vendor to implement a fraud hotline for employees. It would be a hotline for ethics violations, fraud, and other items such as that. Employees could file the complaint online or by phone. Then the employee would get a code so that they could log in and get an update on the complaint. 
depending on the nature of the complaint, it would be sent to either the HR manager, the finance officer, or the county manager for investigation. The fee for such a service is $5,700 for the first year and $3,300 per year after that. <coughs> There seemed to be a consensus among the committee members that we would rely on the state hotline for now as we have been, educate our employees about the hotline, and put posters of the hotline phone number in the county break rooms. And if we choose to take up the idea of using a third party vendor, we could do that at the next budget session next year. The next item on the agenda was a review of the financial statements. Then after that, I gave the committee an update on the fiscal year 1617 audit. The auditors were actually on site at DSS and the health department the third week of June for program compliance testing. And they'll be on site the week of August 28th for regular field work. Next, the committee reviewed the board of commissioners and county managers travel for the second quarter. After that, I gave the committee an update on where staff was with the analysis of the bids received for banking services. We hope to have the analysis complete in the next two weeks. And then after that, we'll be having um, a meeting with the low bidder to ensure that they can accommodate all of our banking needs. And once we do that, um, I'll be able to make a final recommendation to the Board of uh, Commissioners on which bank I believe we should change to. I'm expecting I'll be able to do that at your next meeting in August. Um, Brian then gave the group an update on the $3 million um, borrowing package included in the fiscal year 17-18 budget. We shared a list of the capital improvements for the public schools with Dr. Phipps, and we just received word back from him, I believe today, that they were comfortable with that list of the projects that we had selected. Um, this borrowing will require LGC approval, so we'll be completing the LGC application over the next couple of weeks. I have had a, co a phone conversation with an LGC staff member in the debt section, and he does not foresee any problems with the application or what we plan to use the borrowed funds for. I specifically ask him, um, you know, does it seem reasonable that we would be borrowing this money for things like um, paving and roof replacements? And he said, yes, people do it every day. So that made me feel a lot more comfortable. Um, having said that, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves on these projects. Um, we do want to get the LGC approval before we get too far into any of these projects. So we hope to be on their agenda within the next two months. The next Finance Committee meeting will be held on September the 19th in this room at 3 o'clock p.m. and everyone is invited to attend. And that is my Finance Committee report. Any, any questions of Anita or Brian? Okay. Uh, item number three is the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners County Leadership Forum on Opioid Abuse. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. And if I could, just a point of privilege, if I could take just a second to introduce a new staff member that we have with us tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Chris Newkirk. Uh, Mr. Newkirk has been named our emergency management director. He started Monday. Um, uh, Mr. Newkirk has a long history of serving in emergency services, uh, both on the volunteer and the career side. Uh, he has spent 15 years uh, with the city of Greenville Fire Rescue Department, where he rose to the rank of lieutenant. Uh, he was instrumental in, in working with the North Carolina Urban Search and Rescue Task Force 10 from its inception uh, and is currently serving as their logistics supervisor. Uh, and in addition, he served for 12 years uh, with, with Pitt Community College as a lead fire and emergency medical services instructor. And so we are very pleased to have him uh, as part of our team. Again, he started Monday. Um, he had to take a holiday yesterday, but we, that was okay. Um, so, uh, but we're glad to have him, and uh, and and is a great addition to our team. So, welcome, welcome, welcome Chris. And I apologize; he was going to do that earlier, and I missed it. <laughs> so, on to the on to the other item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as as you all are aware, you have attended some of the meetings, the Stepping Up Initiative that the Association of County Commissioners. Uh, President McClure 
uh, as you know, every year the president of the association has a, a topic that they focus on, their initiative that they want to move forward with. And his has been the opioid, the opioid abuse issue. Um, you, uh, several of you have been to the Stepping Up Initiative conference that they put on to talk about this. They have put together their, their program. This is a uniform, uniform program that's being distributed to all 100 counties and that they are asking you as a board to, to put your weight behind that and, um, and set up uh, a con essentially a conference where you pull in all of the major players, uh, both from the emergency services side, from the health department side, from the mental health side, uh, the school officials, all the elected officials, there's a whole list, law enforcement officials, to talk about uh, the epidemic that we're facing uh, and what opportunities there are to address that, what we're currently doing and what we may be able to do in the future to, to do that. So this is more of an opportunity to put it out there in the public. Uh, our anticipation, I've been talking with Mr. Madsen with the health department uh, about when we anticipate being able to do that. Our hope is that we'll have that sometime early in September. It'll give us an opportunity to plan and get everything together, get, get all the notifications out. Uh, we are currently working uh, right now um, with some programs. Um, the BC360 has a mental health initiative group that's working on some of those things. Um, emergency services is actually putting together some training for our local emergency responders so that they know how to deal with those uh, uh, with those instances in which they find themselves confronted with um, uh, opioids and other types of, of drugs that they may inadvertently uh, without knowing come in contact with as, as you may have heard or seen on the news um, this is an extremely powerful uh, drug nowadays that they are mixing heroin with um, fentanyl and car fentanyl uh, and there have been instances where responders have actually just brushed up against powder I think one of the had a police officer who had some powder on his clothes and he went to brush it off and because of that interaction actually had an overdose situation from that I mean it is that it is that bad of stuff um, so they are working to do some training with our local uh, emergency responders about recognizing that um, it, it is truly um, an epidemic to epidemic proportions. I mean, we are having folks die every day because of this. <coughs> so just to put that out there to you and to seek your support on it, again, we will move forward based on this plan. And again, it is a plan that the Association of County Commissioners put together with a lot of, with a lot of detail, uh, and they are rolling that out to all 100 counties uh, as part of that initiative to try to get all 100 counties talking on the same sheet of music and pushing for the same thing. So, Well, ahead. I'm getting phone calls from concerned people in the public, and one of the things that I don't want to see happen with whatever we do or whatever we direction that we go in is to create a pity party for the people who are, have overdosed. Uh, I'm, you know, we're, we're looking at, I think one of the things that I don't want to see us do is go in the wrong direction with this. For instance, there, there are babies being born in Beaufort County Hospital that are um, on drugs when they're born. The cost to straighten these babies out is 100000 to a $1 million. Uh, this has fallen on the public to pay for this because obviously, uh, not all, but a lot of the people that are using drugs don't have the money to pay for doing this. Plus, the baby will probably be on the welfare and a, a tax burden to all of us forever. And you can say, well, what about the mother? What about the woman that brought this child into the world in this condition? Under the present system, as I understand it, while there may be laws that, that she can be charged with, she needs to be charged she needs to serve some prison time. This is a taxpayer expense. And while you can say, Richardson, you're not sympathetic, I am sympathetic, but I'm not sympathetic at all to going out with bleeding heart that it's up to us as the public to get the public's expense coming out of the public's pocket to run with these uh, epi needles or whatever they're called so that we save these people. That is not our responsibility as the public. We're taking on another social program when we do this, and it's going to end like all of our other social programs, more and more expense on the public. I'm going to be pushing for these women that do these things 
to receive some jail time that bring babies into the world like this. It's a sin. It's a crime. I'm also going to be pushing to get more Mr. Big. Uh, I got a call today from a, a citizen in the community very concerned about what is going on and how rapid this is. Social services <laughs> funds a lot of this stuff. We're handing out money to people who have children that the parents, the grandparents of, of the end of, of the woman are taking care of the children and they're drawing down public funds and they're using these funds to stay on drugs and to finance other activities that they shouldn't be financing. I, one of the things that I think we should be doing and I think it may be coming down from the administration, if you're getting a check, you're also getting a drug test. And if you're on drugs, you're not getting any more money and we're going to take your children away from you. That serves humanity. I am totally opposed to what I see beginning to be a bleeding heart program that's only going to take money away from taxpayers to fund it for these poor people who have made these mistakes. Well, there are a whole lot of other people out there who have the backbone and the intestinal fortitude to stay away from drugs and never get hooked on the things to begin with. Those are the people I'm supporting. I am not supporting the criminals. Commissioner Buzio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned that the opioids and, and the problem we're having in the United States, and, and that's true. And you mentioned heroin mixed with fentanyl. And my understanding is from some of my friends in, in the agencies that uh, a lot of that fentanyl is coming in from China and Mexico, and it's being mixed with the products. But also in the letter, and you mentioned about prescription drugs, uh, which over the years, uh, when you begin to rank the drugs by the 20 most abused drugs in the country, you usually see that about 14 to 15 percent of the drugs abused in the United States are actually pharmaceutically made products in, in, uh, in the United States that cause most of the injuries. Maybe not all the deaths, but a lot of the injuries. So I'm hoping as, as we move forward on this, this program that we look not only at the illicit side, but we also look at the illicit side and the preventative programs that we can put in place. So I think it's very important that as we put together this forum and these discussions that we not only include the health and the uh, law enforcement uh, in the county, but we also bring in representatives of maybe the medical association. We include pharmacists, physicians, maybe nursing. Uh, some of the things we can look at working with the licensing boards in the state uh, is um, uh, CE programs for our professional staff so that we and I'm not accusing anybody in, in, the, in the county, like the physicians or the pharmacists or nurses, to do anything wrong, but, but uh, helping them to identify what a drug seeker is. And uh, because you, we have a lot of drug seekers throughout the United States that will go out and seek these drugs. Uh, this program is called Stump the Doctor, and they'll use uh, amputees. Uh, so there's a lot of these programs, there's programs out there that, that we, could, we can assist with. And it won't cost us, hopefully it won't cost us much money at all. Uh, but there's things we should look at that not only concentrate on the illicit, but also the illicit substances as we move forward, if we move forward on this program. Uh, Commissioner Langley. First of all, I asked the clerk, I sent you a, a link. Y'all just dispersed that for me from Trillian. We did. And in fact, we got a meeting scheduled Monday with the community college, with health department to talk about the opportunity to apply for that. Um, Piece. You may, are you talking about the grant, or are you talking about the the uh, the stuff from from Dave that had the specific instances from fifteen from fifteen? No, the, the grants. The grant, yes. Okay. Yes, and, we are. Okay, and the other thing is, I want to say this: Commissioner Richards said one thing that was true. For a lot of folk who get hooked, it is a mistake. There are a lot of folk who who get hooked on on these drugs not intentionally then you have folk who just who are just constantly looking for eyes but then you have folk who just genuinely cannot help themselves and actually cry out for help and they're in desperate need of help and my opinion is this you cannot turn your back on folk when they want help you've got to be there to help them you've got to provide the resources to help them you just cannot throw people away because you feel that they are a certain caliber. As long as I live, I will always say this, there are no throwaway people. Everybody 
is a somebody, regardless of how much wrong they may have done in their lives or how jacked up their lives are, they are still human beings. And all that we can do for them, we need to do for them. The day that we turn our back on other human beings and say that we don't care, we have lost our taste of humanity. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Commissioner Brennan. I agree with, uh, with uh, Commissioner Langley, but there's one thing that's, that everybody needs to know about drug addiction. If you're hooked on drugs and you don't want to get off of it, no amount of help that, you, that you're going to receive is going to help, you have, have to hit the very bottom before you can go back to the top. Thank you. Commissioner Evans. I went over to a meeting in Chaka Winnington. It was kind of a community group coming together. And I think there's a way we can track the number of opioid cases that we have because there seems to be an epidemic. It seems the meeting I was in, for some reason, it seems to be coming out of Craven County right now for whatever reason. So there should be some way we can track so we can get a a grip on what's going on and the last thing I, I agree with Commissioner Langley um, if, if we if we get that cruel as a human race that we divest ourselves of the people who's having problem shame on us uh, they've hit bottom they need help and uh, I think this stepping up program is a good program and we need to take to get involved in it we need to do our part because there are people that that need help Is there anyone else that wanted to comment? Uh, so you're going you're gonna to set that meeting up for September? That's our anticipation. Uh, Jim and I are going to are okay. work on that, and, and uh, because the state health director has made that kind of a priority for local health directors, um, so we will work on that together and, uh, and come back to you with, with what we anticipate. But that's our, that's our anticipation, first, first half of September. Okay, we're down to items for presentation. Uh, Brian, you're up on the county budget information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, the reason where I had I had recently I recently was asked to do a presentation um, for the Rotary Club on the budget, and Commissioner Buzio asked if I would do that presentation again. Um, tonight so that's why that's why you see that's why you that's why you're seeing this tonight excuse me while i turn the light off a little bit so you can see <clears throat> so this is the presentation that was made and be glad to answer any questions either as we go or or while we get at the end um for just a reminder and i know a lot of this is is renewal for for the board but uh, for the for the public the the county as does the state and other local governments in North Carolina works off of a fiscal year of July 1 to June 30th. Our budget year starts July 1 and ends June 30th and essentially the way our budget is put together there is a general fund and there are enterprise funds. General funds are funds that are related to tax dollars. It's the, the, the funds that are funded through general tax dollars where you get general fund. Enterprise funds are business-like funds whether that be um, solid waste, whether it be water, sewer, whether it be electric, whether it be gas, those kind of business-like functions that some units of local government do that the funds to pay for the expenses of that service are, gener are, are the revenues are generated by the service itself. Um, so you pay your water bill every year or every month and those funds come back to pay for the operations. So that's the difference in general and enterprise. We also set our budget up on a continuation cycle and an expansion cycle. Now, we take a lot of heat over those, over those names, and, and just to clarify for folks, when we say a continuation budget, we talk to the board about that at your planning retreat, and we simply say, what is it that you want to continue to do next year that you were doing this year? So we talk about those things, and typically we say, what services are you providing this year, and what services do you want to continue to provide next year? We ask you that question and you tell us what you want to do. So that in essence is what we call a continuation budget. Um, an expansion budget can either be a plus or a minus. It can be something that the board, a board member may say, I think we ought to look at adding this or I think we ought to look at taking this away. 
Again, we look at what is a baseline from where the board said, where we are as of last year and what we're going to do next year. Those expansion requests may come from uh, county departments. They may come from outside agencies. But the reason we break those out is so that you're looking at your core mission to start with in the continuation budget. And then you look at these additional things and you look at those individually. They're not lumped into the continuation budget. They're not hidden anywhere in there. They're, they're newer different items that come in as expansions, again, plus or minus, where you hear those individually and you as a board make a decision about whether you like them or whether you don't like them. And you as a board get done for your constituents what you want to get done for them through your budget. So you say, yes, we like that, we want to do that, or no, we don't like that, we don't want to do that. The process that we go through, the board has a planning retreat where we talk about all these things. You give us the initial marching orders, like I say, on what you want to see in the continuation budget, what you like about what you had last year, and what you want to see continued in the next year. Then we do our internal budget work. Of course, I've heard comments that we just rubber stamp it and move it on. We don't do that. We spend a tremendous amount of time working on those budgets. And I assure you that the finance officer and I sit down with every department head individually, and we go through line item by line item, each of those budgets. And we look at historical trends. We look at where they think they're going to roll up at the end of the year. And we look at what they're anticipating their, the, the normal growth will be and for them to be able to continue providing that service that you've asked them to continue to provide. Once we do that, we put a budget together. There's a recommended budget that comes to you as a board. You hold public budget workshops where you discuss that, where we lay it out for you, where you discuss it from a general fund side, where you hear the, the enterprise funds, and then you hear uh, the agencies and the departments come in and talk about their service expansion request. And you make that decision about what you want to do. There is a public hearing that's required by general statute. You hold that, you've held that, and then you adopt the budget from that. This is a glance at our budget this year. In the general fund, it's a little over $60 million. Now, in that $60 million, it includes th the $3 million borrowing package. So to, so to compare apples to apples, which is what we want to be able to do, we want to be able to look historically year over year where we are so that we can see whether we're up or down. We take out that three million because, and the reason we do that is because if you were to have had a bond issue where you were going to build a school next year at $20 million, your budget would look like an $80 million budget because we're required to show that money coming in, in our budget, and we're required to show that money going out. But is that what you're going to see every day, every year? No, it's not. So that's why we show that three million pulling out. The total budget is $60 million, a little over that. But looking at apples to apples, if you will take out the $3 million, you're a little over $57 million. Now, that $57 million is what we're calling the operational and debt service. So the debt service for paying off that $3 million loan is in that $57 million. So year over year, apples to apples, that's where you stand compared to last year. You'll see that last year your, your initial recommended budget or your initial approved budget was $56.7 million. So the difference there is a little over a quarter of a million dollars or less than 5% growth. So you've had about, you've had less than 5% growth in your expenditures. Five if you look at. Five tenths of a percent. I'm sorry, half a percent, I'm it's, sorry. It's 45 basis points. I'm sorry, <laughs> you're right. Half a percent, I, was, I, I meant to say half percent, I said 5%, I'm sorry. So it is, a, it is less than 0.5%. Uh, you appropriate one, a little over a million dollars in fund balance. In the 1617 original budget, it was 919, near about $920,000 appropriated. This year, it was up 124 after your budget negotiations and, and final budget document. So it's about 13.5% up from what you, you appropriated last year. When you look at where your fund balance is, um, when we anticipate, when we look at this calculation, we say we will spend every bit of the money that you appropriate, including every bit of the fund balance that you've appropriated. Now, we typically do not do that. Um, so there is some fluctuation there. But in calculating the number of the $4.5 in fund balance that we estimate on June 30th of 2018, that means we spent everything that you appropriated, including all the fund balance. 
If that occurs, we anticipate that you'll have $14.5 million in spendable fund balance. Now, there's a difference. Remember how in fund balance, you've got a greater number in fund balance, but there's restricted funds in fund balance that you have to show. There's stuff that, res that is reserved by state statute that you have to show in there. So there's this bigger pot that's by, that is by statute called fund balance. And then there's a smaller piece. And of course, GASB has changed the name of that a couple of times. But the, the takeaway from it is that's the amount of money you can, you can spend if you want to spend it. The other you can't. It's reserved or, it's, or it has to be in there and you can't touch it. So that's why we show whether it's whatever the, whatever the latest word they're calling it, but it is the spendable fund balance of $14.5 million. That is equal to 25.72% of your expenditures. Now, you'll recall that the, the board's rough policy on that is about 35%. There's been discussion over the board over the last couple of years about whether that needs to be that high. There, the, the board originally said, you know, we're good with getting to about 25%. Um, so that's kind of where you are. You'll see you're at 25.72 if everything is expended uh, in the entire budget and, and our calculations work out about right. On the revenue side, Property taxes make up about $33 million of the revenue in, in the budget, in the general fund budget. That is 55 cent per ad valorem. That's on the value of the property. For every $100 of valuation, you charge 55 cent. That is not an increase from the prior year. It is the same as where you were last year. Sales and other taxes is about 8.9 million. Um, that's a little above where we were and we anticipate that growing simply because of the, the General Assembly, as we've talked about, has broadened that base uh, on sales tax. What is applicable to sales tax? You know now that if you, go, you could get your car or tires changed, you're gonna, pay, um, you're gonna pay sales tax on that service and a lot of other services. Um, for us, we aren't able to see in tremendous detail the sales so it takes us some time to historically understand what the sales tax trends are. We track all that, um, but we can't say if you do this, then we will see this. So, so we work really hard to watch that. But every time they change it, it kind of resets our base. 11.6 in restricted and intergovernmental. Those are restricted revenues that come in that have to be expended for certain things. And then the intergovernmental uh, revenues that we they get passed down from the state or the federal government. Licenses, licenses fees, and other is about 5.1. That is where the $3 million revenue side is on the, on the borrowing packages included. So if you took the three out of there, you'd be at, you'd be at two uh, on the licenses and fees. That's where you're charging fees or you're charging license fees to recover some of the costs uh, for county services that are specifically being applied to individuals so you know who are using that service it's not the it is an attempt to help offset some of those costs like if I have a dog or I go adopt a dog I pay money for that um, so those are licenses and fees if I get picked up by EMS I'm paying a fee for that um, so it's to help offset some of that subsidy that's coming from general fund dollars. We're anticipating about $100,000 in investment earnings. Of course, that's a lot better than we've seen in, in the last few years, and we hope that continues to grow um, as, as the markets change. And then the appropriated fund balance of a little over a million dollars. So that's what it looks like when you put it in a pie chart. Property <laughs> taxes are about 58% uh, of your total budget on the revenue side. And I would, I would dare get, show, say to you that if you looked back over four or five years ago, 10 years ago, that was a smaller chunk. Uh, and that has been, there's been a concerted effort, as you, uh, as you know, from the General Assembly to push more services down to the local governments to let them pay for them. Um, in fact, I, I recall open conversations in the General Assembly several years ago uh, that property tax rates in local governments were too low and that they needed to increase them um, because the state was pushing more things down and that will continue to happen and as you know that's one of the that's one of the goals of the association of county commissioners it's one of the goals of the north carolina league of municipalities and that's constantly playing defense uh, to try to keep the state from pushing down services and saying we're going to mandate that those services occur and we're also going to mandate the local governments pay for them but as you know Local governments are creatures of the General Assembly, and you can only do what they tell you to do when they tell you to do it. 
These are your expenditures for the 17-18 budget, ranked in order of largest. Of course, education, and I would say that every county in North Carolina, their largest expenditure is education, $17.6 million. Human services, 17, a little over $17 million. Public safety, $11.5 million. General government, 5.8, and then community services, 1.8. That's how they break out. And those are typically what you normally see. You'll see education, the largest, across counties. You'll see human services, DSS, health departments, those human services pieces, uh, the, the next largest, and then public safety behind that. The $3 million borrowing package that you approved as part of your, your budget, um, what we are proposing is a 10-year term at, at a 3%. What we've, what we've reached out to the market to understand, we think we can get that for about 3%. It's using asset security, um, which means it's 160A financing is what we call it, what it's called. Uh, and essentially what it does, it, it says the asset that you are acqui acquiring uh, is the collateral for the, the person or the entity that's making you the loan. Um, it does not... Um, require or it does not allow you using that type of financing does not allow you to pledge the full faith and capital the taxing authority of the county to, to pay that and if by some reason but again I'll caveat that by saying you can you would never default on a loan because the LGC will not let you default on a loan but if you were able to ever if that were ever to occur it wouldn't because the LGC would come in and take over that and even if it did under collateral fi under security asset security financing that's all the that's the only piece that the bank could go after is the asset itself um, but again we don't even have that conversation because the LGC would never allow that to occur the proposed projects and you've heard Anita talk a little bit about that in her conversations with the LGC courthouse the bank building the roofing projects the paving projects um, we're feeling pretty confident about the communications tower keep our fingers crossed um, we did some some changes with the state on where those where those antennas were located. They were lowered a little bit on the Ponder Tower, uh, and it has come in uh, below 100. It's a, I think it's a little over 100 percent, but it's not at 105 percent, which is the maximum. And our hope is that the state's going to allow us to go ahead and get on that tower without having to reinforce that tower, we, as we talked about. All the other towers are fine, and then the generator and the modular unit for the landfill. Just a quick note, and I, and I made this point, and I think I made this point with y'all earlier too, was that although that is an enterprise fund, that modular unit at the landfill, although that is under an enterprise fund, the enterprise fund will be paying the debt service back to the general fund on that, on that acquisition. So, and again, we are talking about uh, capital assets and GASB, uh, the, governmental the Governmental Accounting Standards Board defines capital assets. Um, as land, improvements to land, easements, buildings, building improvements, vehicles, machinery, equipment, works of art, and historical treasures, infrastructure, and all other tangible or intangible assets that are used uh, in operations and that have a initial useful lives extending beyond a single reporting period. A single reporting period for you is one fiscal year, July 1 to June 30th. So anything that is, it lasts over a year, um, is, is defined as, as, a, as capital asset. Uh, there may have been a little confusion about your mixing the two um, borrowing pieces. You're currently, as you're aware, you're currently refunding some of your school bonds. This borrowing package is not two-thirds financing. Um, there is an opportunity under the laws of North Carolina to do two-third bond financing, and, and I don't want anybody to get confused about that. But what that is, is you can take a general obligation bond, like a school bond or any general obligation where you have pledged the full faith and taxing authority of the county to that bond and it has been approved by the voters. The general statutes allow you to go back, whatever you paid off in that bond over the prior year, you can go back and reissue those bonds in the amount of two thirds or less without any additional work. Obviously, it's a bond, so you've got to go back to the market. So it's expensive to do that. And most folks don't do that unless they already have like a bond issue coming up. I've only done that once in my career, and it was when we were financing a school, we were doing a school bond. So we looked back to be able to do two thirds financing because we were already going to be in the market. So it didn't cost us any additional because it's expensive to go to the market and issue bonds. 
That is not what this is. It is not two-thirds financing. And it is also not uh, refunding of our, of our school bonds. The school bonds are being refunded. You're doing that to get a lower rate and to save money on those. You're going to save about $12,000 a year. That is totally separate from this piece. These are your EMS and fire districts for the 17-18 budget. We talked about fire. Uh, the north side district, there was an approval to take that to 3.75 cents. That was up a little uh, 0.85 cents per 100. The Chakawinity Township requested and was approved uh, to go up on the fire side by 1.4 cents. So there's a total of 4 cents on the fire tax there. The Richland Township is a combined fire and EMS township. It was a, it's the only um, district that you have in the county. It was done by uh, uh, voter approval, a, a, a request initially by the citizens in that area for a request to have a, bond, a, 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 a voter referendum on it. They, they did that. They approved it. That's unique in the county because that's the only one you have. The, the rest of them were established by the board. Um, so you still are the taxing authority, and you still are the ones who levy that tax and control that. So um, it still goes back to you, but that's a, that's a little different in the way that was formed. Um, they requested an increase of 2.45 cents for both the EMS and the fire. As I say, it's combined, so that total right there is 6.35. On the EMS side, um, as you're aware, in the program that, that we talked about last year and then again this year in the Washington Township, that bumps that to the maximum of five cent. So it was up 50 cents, um, a, half, a half a penny, I'm sorry. Um, the Chocolate Township was requested to go to five cent. Uh, that was a penny and a half. And then the Chocolate Municipal EMS went up the same amount to a penny and a half. Um, as you recall there, you, have, you, you cannot levy a tax in a municipality for a district without that district, without that municipality's consent. So when that was originally, originally done, you had a district that was outside the municipality and then you have the, the, essentially the district that is within the corporate limits. Um, so those two provide for the, for the Chaco Entity Township. Um, what else I was going to tell you about that? That's it. Um, here's your property tax comparison uh, based on sales ratio and effective rates. And, and this is a method that the state of North Carolina Department of Revenue uses um, to essentially have apples to apples across the state of North Carolina. So you look at the counties that are surrounding us, you look at their tax rates, and then you look at the sales ratio. And what you'll see is like Beaufort County has a sales ratio of 106.14. And what that means is our property value assessment, and of course we do that once every eight years. January 1 of the, of the revaluation year is when you take a snapshot. And that snapshot is what the market is at that time. And then that value holds for the next eight years, at least the way it's set up in Beaufort County. Mm -hmm. the, the statutes allow you to have revaluation more often but you have to have it at least every eight years. You can't go beyond eight years. Some counties do it every four years, but it is a very expensive process to do that. So um, you probably don't want to be doing it every year because you couldn't afford to do it. Um, but what that says is our assessed valuation is 6%, 6.14% higher right now than what the market is. So let that sink in for a minute. Typically what happens if you look back before we hit the Great Recession, we took a snapshot and market values continued to go up. We didn't change. So you see Pamlico County, they're at 92%. So their, their valuation is less than what the market is. And it just depends upon where you were in the cycle on your revaluation. But what happened with Beaufort was back when, back when you did the last revaluation, the market was going pretty much gangbusters. You had, it hadn't turned down yet. So we pegged it at that limit, and then over the next seven years, the market turned down. So you see that the market is less than what your value is. But we don't go back and adjust that. You adjust it once every eight years. Uh, typically, you haven't seen this. You, you, you typically see property appreciate, not go down in value. That's what's happened over the Great Recession uh, for counties who pegged their revals at a time where the market was still high. So, if you'll look, what you do is you take the tax rate, multiply it times the ratio, and that gives you what your true effective rate is. So if we're, you'll see where Beaufort County is, we're at 55 cents, 
but we're six percent above what the market is so you multiply that across and your effective tax rate is is um, 58.38 cent so you look so it allows you to look across the counties irregardless of when their revaluation cycle is and figure out how you rank up so you'll see in the last column there among all counties number one being the highest taxed county in North Carolina uh, Beaufort County ranks number 68 and you'll see our, our surrounding counties uh, where they rank on their effective ratio um, Cravens below us Pamlico's below us um, but but our surrounding and, and, and that's interesting if you look at Pitt Pitt's 46 we're 68 um, now Pitt County as you as you know has a lot of tax exempt property East Carolina's tax exempt has a whole lot of property over there uh, so but it's interesting it gives you a different perspective on on looking at taxes and looking at where you are um, then we move on to the enterprise funds uh, we have the only we, we operate two enterprise funds the water fund and the solid waste fund under the water fund it's a little over seven million dollars we have seven separate water districts this year is the last year of the three-year program for a three percent increase in rates um, the board intentionally did that as you recall over the last three years based on the laddering up of the debt that was incurred when those districts were formed several years ago so that that those payments ratcheted up and you in turn said we've got to ratchet up our revenue side to meet that and to be able to pay for those later down the line so that's the this is the final year of that three-year program of raising at three percent there's the range of your of your water rates with the lowest being in the Bunyan district and then the highest being in the Pantiga district and of course we do that by the first 2,000 gallons and then everything above a thousand gallons at a different rate Interpr the, the second enterprise is the solid waste fund that's a little over, a little over 3.2 million dollars this year uh, that is paid for or it is funded by $145 per dwelling per improved dwelling fee um, it is a fee it is a utility fee it is not a tax general statutes allow you to show it on the tax bill and we show it on the tax bill and you're authorized to collect it as if it were a tax you can't do that for your order side but you're allowed to collect this just like it were a tax so not that we've ever foreclosed on somebody for not paying their their solid waste fee but it all gets lumped in together um, the statutes allow that to occur so it is shown on your tax bill for, for there's a little bit of confusion sometimes about what that pays for that pays for all residential waste costs in Beaufort County so if you live in a municipality and you're paying the 145 it's paying to pay for the disposal of all waste all residential waste in Beaufort County if you're living in a municipality and you're paying a trash pickup fee that's simply all that is is the pickup fee it's not the disposal fee the county's paying the disposal fee for all the residential solid waste in Beaufort County we also provide 11 convenience sites spread out across the county so that people can take things to that if you're out in the county you don't have residential pickup um, and then there's a transfer station where all that waste goes to and then it is shipped out of the county uh, to a regional landfill um, so that is your that is your final enterprise fund um, appreciate the opportunity answer any questions you may have or I'll sit down and be quiet all right does any of the commissioners have any questions or comments I, I have a question okay a three million dollar bond issue when that money comes in it's going in the general fund then it's going to be sent back out it, it will be put into a project fund and the reason it will go into a project fund is because it will survive multiple fiscal years because you may not get it all spent in one fiscal year so it's just like we we've done that with with other capital projects so that it you know it doesn't have to come back okay <clears throat> One of the uh, things that you read and hear from time to time is some some counties look at the educational budget as a percent of the property taxes collected, uh, not as a percent of the total budget. And the number that I saw recently, one of our counties up in the, I don't know whether it was Wake or, but it was in the, the triad area, their article said that their number was 50 some percent of the real estate if you do the math for Beaufort County that number is 53 percent that's the total educational budget divided by the total uh, 
property taxes. Any, if if there's no other questions or comments, we'll we'll take a 15 minute break. Bingo. Okay, we're down to uh, items for decision. Our first one is the bid approval for the HMA 2014 elevation of two houses and HMA 2015. I'm sorry. Here she comes. <laughs> we're on uh, items for decision number one, Katie. Uh, Lisa, you're up. Um, the four houses that we are uh, here about are 153 Harbor Drive, 5485 VOA Road, 487 Ridgecrest, and 364 Mill Street. And um, Chris is actually going to go over the bid, bid opening with you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, <laughs> Uh, we had a bid opening for these two projects on uh, June 22nd. Uh, we had five bidders. Um, the, the, these are the last two houses of the FY14 FMA project and the first two houses of the FY15 project. So um, the recommendation to the board is to go with the low bidder uh, on the unit at 5485 VOA Road, which is Dillahunt, uh, the low bidder at 487 Ridgecrest Drive, which is Dillahunt, and then the low bidder at 364 Mill Street in Bellhaven, uh, which is uh, Gilbert Everett. And then um, uh, Dillahunt rescinded their bid on the 153 Harbor Road. That is a complicated unit, very complicated unit, probably the most, one of the more complicated units we've ever done. Um, and uh, he rescinded his bid, uh, which he was probably not going to get recommended to award both of the final units of the FY14 project anyway. Um, so we were recommending we go to the next low bidder, which, which is Paul Wooler. We're just asking for a decision from the board tonight. Just live. Okay, uh, you've heard the recommendation. Uh, any questions of Chris or Lisa? I just have one question. You're, you're satisfied that Bill Hunt can perform for the county? Yes. Um, I, I personally was involved in administration in uh, Pamlico, a recent Pamlico County project that uh, Dilla Hunt completed about nine or ten houses down there. So, yeah, it, we, okay. can, we can get through it. Uh, excuse me. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, does he does he finish his work on time? Um, does anybody finish their work on time? Good work. <laughs> no. Because uh, the answer to that is, no, is probably no. So um, that we struggle we struggle with with a lot of them and getting it done on time. Uh, but I would say he's he's you know as good on, as any. Or, or, as good as any. Yes. Okay. As good as any. All so. right, thank you. We just got some bad news, Bob. The, the market is tough with the contractors now because there is just not that many um, uh, trades out there, the lack of plumbers, electricians, things like that. Everybody's using the same people. I got you. So the, the time element is subcontractors. <laughs> yes. Yes. I it's, thought it always They all try to use the same masons, <laughs> you know, things right. like that. Any other questions? I make a motion that we uh, we accept the two low bids. Okay, got a motion by Commissioner uh, Brin. Is there a second. second? Second by Commissioner Booth. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Vote was unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're down to item number two, the award of professional services contract. Uh, Christina. Good evening, commissioners. I presented uh, to you on page 201 of your agenda book is a recommendation to award a professional services contract to REI engineers. Uh, this is the firm that completed the roof assessment 
for the county back in uh, 2016. And if you'll recall, included in the fiscal year 2018 budget, there were funds to complete four roofing projects. So this is the first step in completing those projects, which is awarding the design of the projects. Uh, it is our recommendation that we award that to REI engineers because they are familiar with our roofs. Again, they completed the roof assessment, um, and we believe that they would do a good job. Uh, because of our purchasing policy, any contracts for engineering services that are above $10,000 must be brought to you for approval. So that is why I'm here tonight asking for approval to award the contract to REI. Motion to approve. Got a motion by Commissioner Langley. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner uh, Brand. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Those opposed? No, it's for okay. It. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you want to go to the next item? Uh? Yes, sir. Again, following the same procedure, uh, this is a recommendation to award a professional services contract. Uh, included in the fiscal year 2018 budget were funds to complete a facility condition assessment. Uh, what this would uh, entail is uh, a team coming in to look at all of our buildings. They would. I look at the structural systems, the mechanical systems, electrical, plumbing, as well as the architectural elements of the building. They would prepare a report to us, giving us the status and the condition of those systems. There would also be included in that a capital, capital project planning schedule. I'm not sure at this time if that would be a 10-year or a 15-year or a 20-year plan. We'll have that discussion. Um, as we continue going, but they will do that and they will provide estimated cost for doing that. So the purpose of this plan is something that we've all spoken about in the retreats for the past few years and in these meetings of the desire for the county to have a more uniformed plan in order to take care of our buildings and to take care of our assets. Uh, obviously, we know that we have a lot of money um, that's tied up each and every year in these buildings and we want to protect our investment and so we would like to have a plan in place so that each year when we present the budget to you we can show you that this is the first year of a plan or the second year of a plan and it also allows us to um, update a capital improvement plan and so that we can plan for the future so we'll know exactly what needs to be done. Uh, the reason that I'm recommending <coughs> dude solutions and yes that is the name dude solutions d-u-d-e um, this is a company that's been in existence for many many years they actually started as a um, program for school constructions and for school maintenance and through the years they went from uh, school dude to then facility dude and now dude solutions is just an overall name for the company but we utilize their work order program in the maintenance department so we are already in the dude family so to speak and so my recommendation to to allow dude solutions to complete <coughs> the facility condition assessment is so that the um, recommendations that they make will automatically be rolled into the work order system so that that will be a part of our work order system and so we will have the reminders that pop up and it will all be incorporated into one one system in one program instead of us having multiple systems that we have to update any questions any, anyone have any questions Motion to approve. Got a motion. I'll second that. By Commissioner Wren and second by Commissioner Buzio. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Vote was unanimous. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much. Uh, we're down to item number four, the legislative session law update, subdivision regulations. Uh, Seth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Um, so recently at, this, at the state level, we've had some legislative session law uh, passed it became effective on July 1 um, in the effect of the things around the city and uh, county governments but particularly here we have two small changes that will uh, need to adopt into our subdivision ordinance um, largely these are very minor and I think in, uh, in effect will are both a, a benefit to the taxpayers but I um, think that we'll probably see used just a couple of times a year first to the definition of a subdivision um, the state has approved language that will replace um, the definition that we already have as exemption from the subdivision ordinance related to settlement of an estate. 
Um, and the second would be something as uh, similar to an exemption, but really more of a um, expedited review for subdivisions um, greater than five acres and in, into not more than three lots. Um, again, these are things that won't really affect us anyway. Um, but we need to make these changes and the, the processes that we have to um, read them into the record at a um, public hearing, advertised public hearing. So I need a, a recommendation from the board to advertise a public hearing, which we can go ahead and do for the August 7th meeting with the board's approval. Ah, yes. Commissioner uh, Booth? But, uh, maybe I misunderstood. You said if, if you got five vehicles lot, you can't subdivide it, but make three building permits, the, three building lots. The intent of this um, expedited review is to give um, the subdivider the opportunity to not turn in a preliminary plat. In some um, municipalities or counties, they'll have mandatory approval processes for both preliminary and then final. It can take up to a couple of months. In this case, they're saying we will we'll, you can skip that process, go straight to a final plat. Anytime you have a, a track of land between five and ten acres. Okay. Okay. And if you do only three lots on that particular arrangement, we'll let you skip the process. So, so I can, so I can uh, on my lot, I can I can go ahead and put the three plats up there. Say I want to sell on my acre, my acre lot. The other two I got to go to the to the commission to get that approved. Is is that's what it's saying? Mm -hmm. Essentially, yes. Sir. And then you uh, to, well, to be excuse me. Go ahead, to it. Well, yeah, and say, <clears throat> in order to be exempt, you can't then resubdivide for ten more years. But it, again, it's it's not that big of a benefit for folks. They can do it. They can do this anyway. They just turn in a preliminary plat, which around here we can um, review and make a decision on in a day or so. Well, what's going on? Just as Seth said, is the legislature is getting a lot of complaints because of the bureaucracy in some of these uh, government agencies. Pitt County, for instance, I just cringe every time it comes to go to Pitt County to do anything, whether it's the town of Greenville, city of Greenville or the county because it's, it's layer after layer after bureaucrat. For instance, you have to show the nearest fire hydrant. If it's 10 miles away, you still have to show the, how far it is to the nearest fire hydrant. All kinds of crap that does nothing but slow everybody down and you're sitting there waiting on somebody. So in order to fix that, what the legislature has said is, <clears throat> excuse me, for small developers, if you have a piece of land that is uh, five acres or more that has not, no part of that land has been subdivided within the last 10 years because that puts you into a whole different ball game. You can go in with a plat that meets the requirements of the local ordinance, whatever that is. Okay. And you don't have to go through a preliminary process, as Seth said, where you submit it and 30 days later they're going to come back and pick at it and give you a bunch of stuff. You can meet the, if you can meet the, the standards within a week, you can have your subdivision going. That's the whole purpose of this. In some three lot subdivision. In some places charge very high fees as well. Yeah, so review fees and there's all kinds of stuff that go into it. So it's it's a way. The whole purpose of this is to expedite small developers or even big developers who want to say, "I'm going to do these three lots because I can do this quick. I can get somebody out there building houses. Then I've got to come back with the full review process." For the rest of the parcel of land, I got you. But it's a way of expediting development. I got to see. There's it. limited risk when you're looking at a, three lots that are totaling five to ten acres. I mean, this is big, big, big lots. Obviously, in a wide open area. I got it. Now they still have to meet all the standards. And they still have to meet all the requirements. That's right. You you just, they still have to meet all the standards. Okay, we need a motion to uh, put this on the August seventh agenda. Move. Uh, Commissioner uh, Langley made the second. motion. Second by Commissioner Booth. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Before right. we do that, do, do we have to have a public hearing? That's what it was. That's right. Is that what you? Yeah. That's what yeah. the motion yeah. is for. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Uh, vote was unanimous. Katie, uh, you want to go ahead with number five, No Wake Zone, Battleina Creek. Thank you, yes, sir. Um, recently, we were contacted by staff from the Wildlife Resource Commission. Um, with the results of a periodic review of administrative rules. It's something that's um, mandated by the legislature. Um, they just discovered an existing no-wake zone on the books for Beaufort County. 
um, that in talking with their enforcement officers has probably never been marked, hasn't been marked at least in several years, which means the officers can't enforce it. Um, there's no development right now along that creek. Do the commissioners want to keep it or not keep it? Well, it's it's within the um, jurisdiction of the town of Bellhaven and adjacent to town. You've got um, several lots cut out that are recorded lots adjacent to this creek that could see development in the future. The town manager, Woody Jarvis, asks or to consider letting it stay on the books. It's not costing the county or the state anything. If we did away with it and then came back asking for it again, you know, the process is six months to a, a year to get get one process. I spoke with the state. They have no problem with this letting it stay where it is. At some point, if the um, you see development on the creek and they want to mark it, the town of Bellhaven will be responsible for paying for those markers anyway. Any any questions of staff? Make a motion to okay. approve the no wake zone or to keep it's, it on the books. To let it, yeah, recommend the state right. keep it on the books. Motion by uh, Commissioner Evans and a second by Commissioner Buzio. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Vote was unanimous. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Down to item number six uh, solar and wind farm ordinance. Uh, Commissioner Richardson. Well, this is just a request that the county uh, gather information, in particular, in this motion is from Currituck County because they put the moratorium on, and I felt like we needed to educate ourselves on what happened up there, whether or not we wanted to do anything about it. That's, that's the purpose of the ordinance, I mean, of the request. Okay. I, are you making that in form of a motion? Making that in form of a motion that we gather the ordinance information from Currituck, Cur, uh, not Currituck County. County. It is. Is it Currituck? Is it Currituck? County, and that that be distributed to all the commissioners so we can educate ourselves as to what's going on. Sack Chairman. I. <laughs> Commissioner Buzzier. What? <laughs> Did We're I okay. We'll go. Second. Uh, <laughs> did you? I, I, I second the motion. Okay. We got a motion and a second. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to uh, 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 Commissioner Richardson uh, uh, approval or concurrence. I'd like to amend his motion. And uh, so what it would read would be direct the county manager bring back the Caratuck counties and surrounding county ordinances that are applicable to wind and solar farms and, uh, and have the manager present them to the commissioners at the August Board of Commissioners meeting. In addition, the commissioners will begin discuss in, in addition, the commissioners will begin discussing at the August meeting and possibly subsequent board meetings the existing solar farm ordinance dated September 9, 2013, to determine if the current ordinance should be amended or the commissioners may decide to make minimal changes or make no changes. I don't I can agree to that. If the uh, second can agree. I can agree. Great. So we don't have to do an amendment, right? No, we'll resubstitute. Okay. Katie, okay. You, you've got that? I have a copy for you. Substitute motion. All right, Mr. Chairman. Uh, questions? Uh, just a comment. I went in today preparing a little bit for this meeting, and up in Pequimans County, which is pretty close up there, they've got two ordinances. They've got a, well, they actually got three. They've got a solar form that says large or small that you can go up and take a look at. We may want to take a look at both of them. And then they've got the wind turbine, you know, ordinance up there. I, so I, they're they're available online. We don't I, have to worry about no wind turbine ordinance. The, the feds done, done that for us. I, I think the motion is broad enough that- Broad enough. Broad enough, enough. yeah. That you can, <laughs> yeah. you can also yeah, pull, uh, there's Ramble been some here. comments made of yeah. Johnston County, which is right adjacent to Wake too. Are you the only problem I have, the only problem I have is we want him to gather all this information for next month. Now we're asking him to do a lot. With what's going on here? No, I I think we're asking him to get the information, but um, get the information, get it to us in a hard copy. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, what I heard Commissioner Buzio say was surrounding counties. Correct. Are you defining that as contiguous to Beaufort County? I mean, I'm just trying to get a scope on this thing. <laughs> We'll, meant, we'll go all we'll, we'll call all 100 counties if we need to but <laughs> I meant, but I mean I'm just trying to get a scope because if you're saying surrounding it could be I mean, defined for me 
Uh, what I meant was, and is I'd need Mr. Richardson, Commissioner Richardson's concurrence and, and Commissioner, is the ones surrounding the county, touching Contagious. general area Contagious. of the county, okay. Eastern, yeah. but, but I, I you do all hundreds of counties. Right, and I don't have a problem since you have the suggestion for Perquimans County and for Johnson County with putting them into the mix. I mean, if commissioners want that, that's fine. It's an education process. Right, pertinent, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Just Anything else he thinks is pertinent? All right, Commissioner Evans. I mean, there's a list online. I think if we're going to do that, just go where there. We don't need to look at a county that doesn't have any, any solar farms or anything. I think we just look at the ones that are in the motion, which is Perquimans and Johnson, plus the ones that are contiguous. I, one comment I would make that uh, during our public comment uh, section, uh, as it related to Currituck County, I, I've, I've read two articles, and as I understand it, what happened in Currituck County is one is up and operational, which is 650 acres, and the moratorium affects the real large one, which was going to be 2,000 acres. But there is one that's operational right. that is the largest in the state, and that's 650 acres. Okay, any other dis discussion <laughs> before we take a vote? No, go ahead, Don. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure, Jerry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> All right. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Vote unanimous. Okay, we're down to the solid waste fee assessment. Uh, huh? Well, let me describe a little bit of the purpose of this. I would just like to have see maybe it may be that we get a list of the people right now who are exempted from paying solid waste from the tax assessor. Uh, I would like to see that to see the nature of the people that have been exempted, uh, all of the people that have been exempted so far up until now so that we can sort of see how this thing works, make sure we get all these people. That will also give us an idea of how many people are out there, and I know the manager already has an estimate of that, but I would really like to see who's been exempted. Okay. That's the whole purpose when I said an audit here. It's not necessarily an audit. A, a list would be an audit for me that would satisfy me of all of the people who, who up until this year have not been paying solid base fees. I, Bobby, I, I've got a, my question is, can you, can you go in and do a uh, data search as it relates to the, the ones that were exempt or last year? We're working on that with uh, Eric at uh, Farragut. He's going to try and get us a list of all the ones that we maybe are requesting, right. ones that have been released, because what we've been releasing, we need to put back on. So that's what we are working on right now. So. You, you had to do that anyway. Yes. Yeah. So we would have to go back and do that anyway. I would just like a printout of the okay. of the list. We'll, we'll then, see what we can get get to you next time. Any other commissioners that would like it, you know, we need to be able to look at that. We'll, yeah. we'll provide it all commissioners. We've, Fiscal we've year sixteen last year. Yeah. Hmm. I. I don't, I'm not sure that we have to have a motion. I'll withdraw the motion okay. if everybody's, if we have consensus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would say just provide that to all the commissioners when that's available. Excuse me. Okay. We're down to item number eight, the 2017-18 budget reduction. Uh, Commissioner Richards. All right. The reason that I'm making this is one last, I'm taking one last stab at this. I have a serious problem with the, the major change in policy that was done this year when we went, we, we've gone from a pay-as-you-go county to a debt county. And the $3 million that's in there is simply a way to keep from raising taxes uh, and making people think that we're not raising taxes because we're actually spending the money. And my motion is that we direct the manager to reduce all departments except debt service by 5%. That gets us uh, almost $3 million that we need to do these improvements with without having to do a bond issue. So my motion is, again, I'll say it again, we reduce spending in all departments with the exception of debt service by 5% and forego the bond issue. You're, you're saying the $3 million loan? The $3 million, well, it's a loan, whatever you want to call it. All right. Uh, do we have a second to uh, Commissioner Richardson's motion? Hearing none, uh, the motion fails. Okay, we're down to uh, 
Item number nine, the budget amendment, solid waste fund, Anita. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Christina and I, we sat down a couple weeks ago and we reviewed the revenues and expenditures for the solid waste fund to try to estimate where we think we would roll up at June 30th for that, that fund since it is a new fund. And we are anticipating that we are going to have an $85,000 shortfall. Now, there are a couple good reasons for that. We kind of had a perfect storm over the past year. Um, if you'll think <laughs> back, we had a hurricane and nobody could have anticipated that while we were you know, going through the budget a year ago. And there was about $47,000 worth of debris and solid waste expenses associated with Hurricane Matthew. That's the first thing. Um, second of all, our revenues were over budgeted because we did not realize that the nonprofits and churches had historically not paid that fee. So we budgeted as if we were going to collect that fee when in fact they ended up being released or refunded by the tax office. So when you add all that together, we're expecting, um, like I said, an $85,000 shortfall. And what I need for you to do is to appropriate funds from the general fund as a loan um, until which time the solid waste fund can pay the general fund back so we will not end up in a negative cash or net position for that new solid waste fund at June 30th. Mr. Chair, I got a question. Uh, yes, Commissioner Booth. Is any of that money recoupable from FEMA? Yes, in fact, the $47,294 reimbursement has already been submitted. And you still need an $85,000 loan, $85, loan? Yes, but 40 On top of the $47,000? No. Okay, what do you need? We need eighty five, dollars but that includes the forty-seven. dollars but we just hadn't gotten it. When the check has not been received yet. Thirty-eight. Okay. Mr. Lopez. Mr. Oh. Chairman. Uh, yes. Uh, the other remaining monies that we're going to... That, that we're borrowing from the uh, general fund. Uh, how long do you anticipate before that would be paid back? Um, well, the fee is billed one time a year on the tax bill, and that'll probably go out in September, I'm assuming, Mr. Parker? August or September? Okay. Okay. Uh, that's but all people don't really start paying those bills uh, until, you know, end of November, the month uh, of December. Uh, so hopefully come know. January. Okay. Now, I, I want to make sure that commissioners understand the 75000 is a very conservative number. 85. No, 70, 75 is the estimate on, no, I'm sorry. Well, it's 85 up there, but then down under... So we're expecting, we're expecting an $85,000 shortfall. Okay. Now, when we go back and look at the expense side, the hurricane expenses were $47,294. We, we are estimating that about $75,000 was not collected for the churches and nonprofits, and that's a guess, and I think it's a conservative number. Okay. So we're asking just to be saved to transfer the seventy-five thousand plus the four forty-seven thousand two ninety-four. Not that we need probably need that full amount, um, but we thought it made sense to transfer those two amounts added together. Is the forty-seven thousand we've applied for to FEMA for a refund on that? Already have sent that in. So yes. we're hoping that they'll. That'll pay the general fund back. That's right. And then when the revenues come in from tax collection, say in the spring, we the seventy thousand will come back. Exactly. Okay, that's the way I thought it was. Okay, if you take the seventy five thousand and divide it by one hundred and forty five, we're looking at five hundred and seventeen parcels. That's what I was trying to get to. Is that the the number of parcels that we think is exempt is greater than. So, Mr. Parker gave me a revenue number of 129000 The problem is, of those churches and nonprofits, right. we don't know how many people contract with a business to pick that up and take that to the landfill. I got you. If that's the case, then they would be exempt. That is a true, valid exemption. 
so we we kind of back that number down to seventy five thousand, and that is a guesstimate. Okay. I didn't try not to get many businesses in that when I gave the nonprofits and the new churches and things that we will pick up. This is I think this will be not many businesses. Well, I think uh, Brian has made the comment before. This is the first year we've had the enterprise as it relates to solid waste, so we've not really don't have been able to perfect our budget for that enterprise. So, all right. Any other question? If not, we'll take a motion to. Uh, so moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Brand. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Evans. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Uh, the vote was unanimous. Um, we're down to the bid offer to purchase property from the, oh, I'm sorry, at the location of the Aurora Beach. Uh, David? Uh, commissioners are directing your attention to page 229. This is a bid offer uh, from uh, the Bonash. attorney for PCS, <coughs> on behalf of PCS, uh, to purchase two lots that were determined to be owned by the county and have been owned since December of 2011. Uh, they are right at Aurora Beach and are, apparently are in an area that uh, PCS owns all around it. Uh, if you look at the pictures, you can see how small they, they are. And most of them have already washed away. So one of them is out out in the river. <laughs> yeah, about three quarters of it is gone uh, from where it used to be, and uh, the other one is is behind it. I do not know who owns the intervening piece, but I assume it's PCS. I think they own all around. It. I think they own all around. It. They have offered uh, a total of thirteen hundred and ninety-seven dollars uh, to acquire title uh, to this, and as you know. Uh, upon your approval of this offer, if, if that's what you do, like, so we'll run it in the newspaper one time uh, and ask for any upset bids. Um, if there are no upset bids, then we will deed the property to them upon receipt of the difference. They paid uh, $100 deposit, which is 5%. Actually, I move we accept the offer. Okay, second. got a motion by Commissioner Richardson, a second by Commissioner Buzio. Is there any questions before we take a vote? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Uh, the vote was unanimous. Uh, we're down to item number 11, the designation of the voting delegates for the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners annual conference that's going to be held in Durham. Uh, Katie, you're up. You pretty much just said it. I need um, a delegate for the NCACC annual conference this year being held in August. I, I'm, I'm going to be leaving after the breakfast, so this this is going to be at 2.30 on Saturday afternoon. I'll be it. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Langley will be there. I'll, I'll make the motion that uh, he be the, uh, the delegate, and we need a – who's going to be there, too? Uh, you going to be there again? I'll be there. You'll be there? No. Oh, they don't? Okay. Is this the one where they ask for the cell phone number of the person, too? No, that's yours. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, is there a second to second, second by Commissioner uh, Buzio? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Vote was unanimous. Uh, okay, we're down to closed session. Uh, will you read us into closed session? Katie? Okay, uh, do we have a motion to go into closed session? Motion by Commissioner Buzio, a second. second. Second by Commissioner Evans. All those in favor, raise your right hand. We're in closed session. We're now in closed session.
We are currently coming back in for my closed session. Uh, at this time, I entertain a motion to adjourn our Move. meeting. Got a motion by Commissioner Brin, a second. Second. By Commissioner Langley. All in favor of those, Stand please up. stand up. I'm up. <laughs> Good evening.